and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you
first reading for the second Sunday after Pentecost is from Isaiah, the 65th chapter. I was ready to be sought by those who did not ask for me. I was ready to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here am I, here am I, to a nation that was not called by my name. I spread out my hands all the day to a rebellious people who walked in a way that is not good, following their own devices, a people who provoke me to my face continually, sacrificing in gardens and making offerings on brick, who sit in the tombs and spend the night in secret places, who eat pig's flesh and broth of tainted meat in their vessels, who say, keep it to yourself, do not come near me, for I am too holy for you. These are a smoke in my nostrils, a fire that burns all the day. Behold, it is written before me, I will not keep silent, but I will repay, I will indeed repay into their bosom, both their iniquities and your father's iniquities together, says the Lord. Because they have made offerings in the mountains and insulted me on the hills, I will measure into their bosom payment for their former deeds. Thus says the Lord, as new wine is found in the cluster, and they say, do not destroy it, for there is a blessing in it. So I will do for my servants' sake, and not destroy them all. I will bring forth offspring from Jacob and from Judah, possessors of my mountains. My chosen shall possess it, and my servants shall dwell there. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading this morning is Galatians, the third chapter. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, in prison until the coming faith would be revealed, so that the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you were, as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the day set by his father. In the same way, we also were, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son, and of a son, than an heir through God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand once again for the reading of the Holy Gospel. When the herdsmen saw what had happened, 
they fled and told him in the city and, and in the country. Then people went out to see what had happened. And they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told them how the demon-possessed man had been healed. But all the people in the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away, proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to thee, O Christ. We join together now, confessing our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated, except we'd like the children to come and sit on the chancel steps for a brief children's message. So boys and girls, come on down. And if you need mom and dad to come, that's fine too.
remember this in, in closing, that the Bible says, greater is he that is in me, that is Jesus, than he that is in the world. So he saved you from sin, from death and hell, and he saved you from the power of the devil. And he, why he did it? Because he loves you guys. Isn't that awesome? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that, that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We don't have to fear what Satan might do. He has no power over us because we belong to Jesus. Help us to remain in him by faith to love him with all the heart, soul, mind, and strength until that day when he comes again. In his name we pray. Amen. Let's sing our, oh, I, what's going on here next I feel like a 13-year-old or something. Uh, this has been a busy week. Uh, let's sing our next hymn, and I'll see what I can do. If not, I'll sing soprano, okay? Let's worship. <laughs>
But God called Abraham, not only did he ask him to leave his home and his family, but the most significant thing he was leaving behind was pagan idolatry. Everyone except Abraham worshipped false gods. And it's, it's inexplicable to me how this one person raised by an idol worshiper was somehow able to keep faith alive in the one true God. That's the providence of God. That's the working of the Holy Spirit even back then. Abraham was spared the corrupting influence of pagan idol worship. And God separated him not only from his family but their, their practices. To call him to follow his lead to begin to build from Abraham's seed a nation for whom the Messiah, the Savior of mankind, would come. The promise of a Savior was given initially, as you recall, to Adam and Eve in the garden at the very beginning. That promise of a Savior was in jeopardy because it came down to one person keeping faith to God. One person. And if somebody said, God plus one makes a majority, that certainly is true. That was not by design. But God had this one man, Abram, who worshipped him alone. And so God could begin this task of building a new nation for whom the Savior would come. You see, in that ancient world, idol worship was rampant, and the promise of a coming Messiah was in jeopardy, but God is faithful to his promise. One of the things I find interesting about Abram, or Abraham, as he was later to be called, he was called his scripture. Maybe, maybe you've read this. He's called a friend of God. He's called a friend of God. Now, that's a commendation, is it not? When God deems you to be his friend. Now, you probably have many friends, some acquaintances. And some friends are of varying degrees of dependability. You probably have one friend that you can count on that will never let you down. God had found that friend in the person of Abraham. And so God entered a covenant with Abraham by which he promised great blessings, untold blessings, not only material wealth, but spiritual blessings to him and to his descendants forever. Now what is a covenant? A covenant simply, and I use this in confirmation every a covenant simply is a contract that guarantees the fulfillment of what has been promised. God entered into a covenant with Abraham and kept his promise and fulfilled and delivered on that promise to give to Abraham and his seed. Great blessing. And so the Bible says when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him. I think this is about the time he's having a midlife crisis probably. 99 years old. And God comes and he says, I am God Almighty. I'm El Shaddai. Walk before me and be blameless. Walk before me, be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and multiply you greatly. Abraham was overwhelmed and said he fell on his face. And God said, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall you be called Abram, but Abraham. Right, maybe the father of many nations. You see, the word, the name Abram, means exalted father. It's changed to Abraham, meaning a father of of multitudes. For I've made you uh, the father of multitude of nations, not just a nation. That's important to understand. Not just the nation of Israel. I've made you a father to nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring throughout all the generations. For an everlasting covenant. I want you to understand this covenant that God had made with Abraham is an everlasting covenant. So, once again, God reiterates the call to Abraham. Chapter 2, the Lord said to Abraham, leave your nation, your native country, your relatives, your family, oh, and by the way, your idols, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you, Abraham, and you will be famous. You will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you with contempt. All the families, not just some, all families of the earth will be blessed through you. And so again, that, that covenant promise that Paul has repeated a few times in Genesis until Abraham understood the full implications of this covenant, of this call. Sometime later, the Lord spoke to Abraham in a vision and said, Do not be afraid, Abraham, for I will protect you, and your reward will be great. But Abraham is not afraid. Abraham is kind of despairing. The sovereign Lord, what good are all your blessings? I, 
I don't even have a son. God, you promised me a multitude of descendants. I've been happy to have one son to keep on the family name. One son. You haven't given me children. The only, the only child I can count on is, is Eliezer of Damascus, a Syrian. A servant of my household is going to be the heir of my wealth. And the Lord said to Abraham, No, your servant is not going to be your heir, for you will have a son of your own, and you will, he will be your heir. And the, the, then the Lord took Abraham outside. I love this. I, I love what is even repeated in Genesis. Abraham looked up at the sky. It's probably nice to know. He said, Look at the stars in the heaven. Now, Abraham, count them if you're able. Well, Abraham knew what you and I have also discovered at night. You can't count the stars. Abraham, that's how many descendants you will have. As numerous as the stars in the heavens. And it says that Abraham believed God. Now that's the way to believe God that you will have a child and offspring as numerous as the stars in the heaven before that first son is born. Keep in mind, he's 99 years old. And Abraham believed the Lord, and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. Now, sometimes we losers might think that uh, the idea of being justified by faith started with the Reformation. It didn't. It didn't even start with St. Paul. He goes all the way back, and it's revealed to Abraham, the father of the faithful, who was declared righteous because of his faith. Now we come to Galatians, a reading this morning. I, I didn't forget Galatians at all. Know then that it is those who are the a people of faith who are the son, the seed of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, <coughs> preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. So that those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. It's amazing, not only did he promise him a multitude of descendants, but a multitude of nations. And, and God knew that one day he would justify the Gentile world, not just the, the Hebrews, the descendants of Abraham. He would uh, justify the whole world. And so he proclaims the gospel to Abraham. See, God's promised him again and again numerous descendants. And, and Paul says in a reading today in Galatians that uh, it is a man of faith where the sons of Abraham understand this, that when he's talking about this multitude of descendants, it, it's not about pedigree, it's not about genealogy, it's not about race, it's about grace. It has nothing to do with your lineage at all. It has everything to do with the grace of God. Abraham understands that nations and kings will come from you. Those descendants are spiritual descendants as numerous as the stars in the heavens. God promised in the verse of the sentence. But I want you to notice something in Paul's text today. Something very significant he said in verse 16. He, he's referencing back to Genesis 22, 18. And he says to Abraham, In your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. But I want you to understand how Paul in Galatians uh, uh, understands Genesis 22, 18. God promised them numerous descendants, but there was one particular descendant that Paul would mention very specifically, verse 16. He said that when he said, through your seed, he says, understand, beloved, that what, a what God was saying to him, through your seed, that singular, through one person, all nations of the earth would be blessed. That one seed, through all blessings, would come as a person of Jesus Christ. That one seed, and through him, all other descendants, all other men, would be justified through faith. In Christ. One seed. The focal point of God's promise, the focal point of God's covenant with Abraham is that one person, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so God enters this covenant with Abraham, to which he attached promise of blessing to his posterity after him for all time. All these promises find their fulfillment and their expression in the person of Jesus Christ. That one singular seed. All the promises, all the blessings uh, find their fulfillment in Him, they converge in Him, and that we who are in a covenant relationship with Him now, the seed of Abraham, heirs of the promise. Abraham believed God, 
They were a moment ago, and God declared him righteous. You and I look back to the promise of coming Messiah. In Christ, we are saved. We are justified by his grace through faith in his Son. <coughs> the only difference is Abraham lived before the cross, before Christ, we live after. We're looking to the cross of Christ, to his death on the cross, we are both saved, and heirs of the promise. That covenant that God established with Abraham some 4,000 years ago is a covenant that will stand forever. I find it interesting, you may recall last week in our gospel reading, it's kind of interesting. Because Jesus had one of his many dialogues with it, or, or I don't want to say arguments, because Jesus didn't argue. He said arguments, right? He didn't argue with them, but he's having a dialogue. And, and uh, he said, you, you guys say that you're Abraham's children. You know, well, um, if, if you believed him, you would believe me. Wait a second. And, and this dialogue goes on, and I said, wait a second. They're starting to do the math. You're not even 50 years old. You're not even 50 years old. You're going to tell us. You're going to stand here and tell us. You've seen Abraham. And, and they just about hit a grandma when he said, truly I, truly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. He was claiming to be the eternal great I am of Exodus 3, 14. I am that I am. I'm the eternal one. He claimed to be the eternal God, and they just about went to a total meltdown, wanting to kill him. In fact, Jesus went on to say, you know what? I tell you something, Abraham looked to this day. He looked to my day, he saw it, and he was glad. Abraham, with the eyes of faith, saw the coming of Christ. He saw the cross. He looked forward to the day, and he rejoiced before Christ was even born. You and I live this side of the cross, this side of the empty tomb. We look back and are justified by faith in Christ and Christ alone. Absolutely amazing. That covenant of God is still in force. That covenant is an everlasting covenant. Where heirs of the promise that God made to Abraham 4,000 years ago. Now it's interesting. Paul goes on in this text in Galatians and talks about the law. Because people would say, okay, if, if God had this covenant of grace with Abraham, and he preached the gospel to Abraham, what good is the law? What, why do we need the law? Why did God enter into a covenant with Israel and give the commandments of Sinai when we have this covenant of grace? And Paul tries as best he can to explain this to his Galatian readers. He said, look, he said, one covenant does not nullify another. If, if we wrote our will, I think, back in 19... 90. No, actually, 2004, we did update, excuse me. So 15 years ago, that will has not been changed now in 15 years. We haven't seen a need to, but it cannot be changed against our will. It, nobody else can violate the terms of that will. <laughs> Paul says it's the same way with the covenant of God. Nobody can set aside, nullify, or make void a covenant that God has made. He says it's just like a minor change. He says the law has its purpose. It's kind of like a guardian or a custodian of a minor child. Now, when you have a minor child, we first of all, we wrote a will was specifically with minor children. It wasn't because we had deep pockets and leave them an enormous fortune if I die. I, have, I had a will done to name somebody a guardian of my minor children, should I not? Because we did, the state would dictate who takes care of my children. That's not going to happen. So it wasn't because I was leaving past wealth, I assure you, it's still not going to happen. I'm spending your inheritance now, in fact. <laughs> but the thing is, you leave, you leave an estate for your children. You leave them uh, uh, as recipients of your estate and their minor children. You're not going to put them in charge of unlimited resources, are you? In fact, you forget the money. If you have minor children at home in Southern South Africa, how long will you leave them at home unattended? Probably not very long. Your house will be totally destroyed. Imagine if, God forbid, parents uh, are both deceased and there's minor children at home and nobody there to take care of them. What a horrible thought that is. So we appoint a guardian. Paul says, look, you, you can't trust the child, not only with the money, you can't trust them by themselves in the house alone. And he's thinking, that's how God's covenant people are in Israel. He couldn't trust them to be without a guardian, without instruction to live as God's redeemed covenant people. They needed the law to guide them, to show them how to live. So you read the Old Testament, hey, they didn't do a very good job, but they do all those references to the hillsides and gardens and all that. It's nothing, that's, 
a long way of saying they were heavy into idolatry, pagan idol worship. God says, you can't leave these people alone. You leave them alone, and that second commandment's out the window. They worship anything that moves, and if it doesn't move, they'll still worship it. They can't be left without a guardian. You see, when God gave the law to Moses at Sinai, he said, look, I want you to go down and tell these people that I am the covenant of God, and they are my people, and if you keep my commandments, then you'd be my special people above all peoples of the earth. I'll make you my covenant people, and you'll be a special possession of the Lord your God. And so Moses takes the word of God, and, and speaks in the hearing of the people, and they come back, and they say, all that God has commanded, we will do. Scouts honor, we'll do it, God. The prophets, they never did. The reason why they didn't, because they couldn't, they were incapable. God understood that, that they were not capable of keeping his law, living like his redeemed people. They lived like barbarians. So he gave them commandments. They couldn't keep it. God knew it. But through those commandments, they would understand his holiness and their sinfulness and their inability to keep the law. Once they arrived at that understanding, then they, the, the covenant with Abraham, based on grace through faith, takes on a whole new meaning. So think about the guardian you appoint to care for your children, to manage your affairs in your absence. That's what God says the law is all about. Now, sometimes we lose and say, we kind of have this, I think, sometimes simplistic view of law and God. Law bad, gospel good. That's not, that's oversimplification. You, you can't separate the two covenants. The covenant of the law does not nullify the first one. What it does, it shows God's covenant people how they are to live. And so I love their answer. They were dead serious about it. I don't think they were, I don't think they were fibbing. I don't think they were making things up. All that God is required to do, you and I can do that in confirmation, uh, or some of the points in our Christian life say, all that God is required, I'll do it. We don't. So I, it's so appropriate that we can begin our service of confession and absolution. You know, we've messed up. God shows us in his word. But even when you're faithless, when you're sinful, it does not nullify the covenant that God made. By the way, it is God who enacts the covenant. It's not us. It is God who enters a covenant with us and makes us his own. With Abraham, it was as an adult. You know what the sign of the seal of that covenant relationship was? Circumcision. On the eighth day, what I find interesting, he was circumcised. He was 90 years old. I believe his, son, his one son was older. And, and then when Isaac was born, he was circumcised in eight days. That seal of the covenant meant that Abraham was in a covenant relationship with God. He was justified. It meant the same thing for eight-day-old Isaac, that he was in a covenant relationship with God. But I want to tell you this morning, God entered a covenant with you in baptism. I know I have some fellow Christians that would just scream at that, but I want to call your attention Galatians 3.27, I read it before. This, okay, Galatians 3.27, all of us who are baptized into Christ, we had a baptism last week again. All of us who are baptized into Christ have put on Christ. In other words, it's like being clothed in Christ and His righteousness. Every Sunday morning, the pastor comes to church and he puts a robe on, and, and just like that, or you put an overcoat on, you are wrapped in Christ. You are his child. He's entered a covenant with you based on the merits of Christ, what he has accomplished at the cross. You say that a lot of people think, well, you guys believe you're saved and baptized, but I believe you're saved by the blood of Christ. I said, no, you're making a totally false distinction simply because you don't understand. Number one, covenant theology that God enters a covenant with us in baptism. But that's a false choice. It's not the blood of Christ versus baptism. We are baptized into Christ, St. Paul said, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too can walk in newness of life. So it's not the, it's not the cross, not the blood versus baptism. That's, that's a misunderstanding of what we're saying. We're simply saying the moment I am baptized into Christ, and I was baptized into Christ 67 years ago this August, I think it's August 10th, I had to do a lot of searching to find it. I was, I was united with Christ in his death. Paul talks about that in, in, in Colossians when he mentions how we transition from circumcision, like Abraham, to baptism. Baptism now saves you. And he says, in, in baptism, we are buried with Christ 
and raised. Buried and raised in one act of God. It has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with my comprehension or my state of mind, my disposition other than my sinful condition. It is the action of God. It is God that does the saving. It is God who imparts His Spirit. It is God who cleanses us from sin. When we understand baptism in terms of God's covenant with us, just like He entered a covenant with Abraham. Reference I mentioned a moment ago is Colossians 2, 11, 12. We begin to understand that we are in Christ. And when we're in Christ, we are the seed, the descendants of Abraham through faith. It's got nothing to do with your pedigree, your lineage. A lot of people, they find out, oh, really? Your mother was Jewish? Yeah. So? You, 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 you're, 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 you're Jewish. They said, no, I'm Christian. You see, that was nothing special because my mother, who was raised as a Jew, became a Christian in her teens. She came to faith in Jesus Christ as her Savior. Now, if you want to say, well, she never stopped being a Jew, or, or she stopped being a Jew, or she's a still Jew, whatever you want to say. It has no special standing. The only thing that gives us standing in, in our relationship to God for the Lord Jesus Christ, to Him, we are in a covenant relationship with God, a covenant that God will death set aside to, to make void. May God grant to us the true seed, the true offspring of Abraham, that we understand that we can receive from Jesus Christ one blessing after another. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. It's our privilege and our joy at this time to re uh, receive our tithes and offerings so that ushers are going to come and, and assist us. Amen.
Ambla, the only part of the service that's not on the screen, and turn to page 265 in the front of the hymnal, and we'll follow the responsive prayer on page 265. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the gift of divine peace of heart, with all our heart, with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the holy Christian church here and scattered throughout the world, for the proclamation of the gospel, the calling of all to faith, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For this nation, for our cities and communities, and for the common welfare of us all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For seasonable weather and for the fruitfulness of the earth, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For those who labor, for those whose work is difficult or dangerous, and for all who travel, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For all those in need, for the hungry and homeless, for the widowed and orphaned, and for all those in prison, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the sick and dying, for those who care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. This morning, Heavenly Father, we pray for Nancy Spencer, who's been in intensive care this past week. We pray for grace, for strength, and for healing. We pray for the doctors, nurses, and the staff that attend to her needs. We pray, Father, our heart will be steadfast in Christ our Savior. We also pray a prayer of thanksgiving for Brandon Wazowski and Angela Barr, who were married yesterday. We pray your blessings upon them now and always. Keep them in your care. Thank you for the faith and, and the confession of Christ our Savior. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. Finally, for these and all of our needs of body and soul, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. Christ, Christ have mercy. Lord have mercy. Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scripture to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, and learn. And take them to heart that by the patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. And be gracious to you, the Lord, lift up his countenance upon you, and give you his peace now and forever. Amen.